Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. During World War I, efforts were made on all sides to provide servicemen with identity tags to assist with identifying remains. This helped in some cases, but given the nature of the battlefields, many bodies were never recovered or were not identifiable. These servicemen made the ultimate sacrifice. They not only sacrificed their lives, they sacrificed their identity. They are the unknowns. And after World War I, many families had to deal with not just the loss of a service member, but the idea that they would likely never know the final resting place of their loved one. In response to this collective loss, some nations constructed tombs to honor their unknowns. America's Tomb of the Unknown Soldier stands in the Memorial Amphitheater of Arlington National Cemetery. It overlooks Washington, D.C., and is guarded 24-7 by soldiers of the Old Guard, the U.S. Army 3rd Infantry Regiment. To discuss the World War I origins of this tomb, we are joined today by Gavin McElvenna, co-founder and past president of the Society of the Honor Guard, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Welcome, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Amanda. So on Armistice Day, November 11th, 1920, the British and French each buried one of their World War I unknowns in a carefully choreographed ceremony. The British buried their unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey, and the French buried theirs at the Arc de Triomphe. The Portuguese and Italians later followed this example, but when did the United States decide that they should pay a similar sort of tribute to their unknown? And do we know who the main driving force behind this movement was? Now, that's a great question, and, and thanks for bringing that up. Yes, the World War I unknown warrior is buried in Westminster, and the Arc de Triomphe holds the remains for the World War I unknown soldier for the French. During the time that the French were beginning their planning process back in 1919, uh, one of our brigadier generals that was uh, in France uh, after the war found out about this and thought that it was a very good idea. So he pitched a similar proposal to the U.S. Army Chief of Staff at the time, um, which was uh, almost immediately denied by the Army. They thought that it was going to be uh, able that the newly formed Army Graves Registration Service would be able to go to all of the battlefield cemeteries and identify all American dead and get them home so that there would be no need for a memorial or a monument of, of this type, depending on how you wanted to look at it. There was also pushback because Unlike Westminster Abbey or the Arc de Triomphe, the U.S. really doesn't have a single place that fits that uh, kind of a category of a, of a place of honor for the entire nation. American Gold Star Mothers, especially up in New York, pushed for this to happen. And Congressman Hamilton Fish uh, of New York then took up the cause. Now, Congressman Fish uh, served during World War I. It's highly decorated with the Silver Star, and he fought alongside and with the 369th Infantry Regiment, which is most commonly known as the Harlem Hellfighters. And his personal service during that time frame and personal knowledge in witnessing the loss of his soldiers, not only just being killed on the battlefield, but never coming back from missions or being disintegrated by uh, artillery shells, really took to his heart. And so... In December of uh, about 1920, he introduced a resolution in Congress asking for approval to bring home an American who had died in the American Expeditionary Forces in France and bury him with all appropriate ceremonies uh, at the Memorial Amphitheater or around the Memorial Amphitheater in Arlington National Cemetery. Congress did approve this in March of 1921, and the next day, the President Woodrow Wilson, on one of his final acts, signed it into law. That was really the big push. There was a lot of concern at the time because in Great Britain, the idea of bringing home an unknown warrior and burying him with ceremonies and things such as that didn't initially see a lot of public support. And that was because, you know, 
they're coming out of a very long period of conflict and they're trying to recover not only their populace, but their, their economies. And they felt that it was more important to spend the money that would have been spent on ceremonies on the wounded warriors that had come back and the families. But eventually it was uh, approved and they went ahead with those. So as we started looking at plans for the ceremony, we had two really prime ceremonies to look at and and figure out what's going to be the best for the United States. How is the World War I unknown selected? After Congress approved this, there was um, the desire to have this ceremony, uh, selection and ceremony completed by Memorial Day of 1921. Logistically, it was a little hard to do because at the time uh, of World War I, a lot of uh, instances where people fell in battle, that, that's where they were buried. And they were in the process of consolidating a lot of these battlefields into very specific cemeteries. So bodies were still being moved about. And you can imagine that, you know, back in those days, they weren't quite preserved as well as they maybe could have, or the technology wasn't there to preserve bodies as well as they could have after they'd been buried. So in around September time frame, the uh, War Department decided that they would issue orders to the USS Olympia to begin its movement to go to France and bring back the unknown soldier. At the same time, they ordered the uh, Army Graves Registration Service to go to four primary battlefield cemeteries and begin the process of identifying four candidates with four alternates that could be moved to a central location for a selection ceremony. On October 22nd and 23rd, this process began at the San Miel uh, Cemetery, the uh, Ain't Marne Cemetery, the Somme Cemetery, and the Meuse Argonne, which were four of the primary areas or, uh, that American forces had fallen in. Originally, they were given very strict instructions on exactly how to make the selection exactly how to remove the uh, selected candidate, how to examine that candidate, then how to seal it. I mean, all the way down to the point of where they're saying, hey, you will use six screws to close up this casket before it is transported to the final selection site. This also included the destruction of documents where they were trying to ensure the anonymity of the whole process. So the orders that they were received were destroyed, the the cards that they were given, because the cemeteries held many different unknown soldiers, and they were randomly chosen as to go to this plot, pull this uh, casket out. And so those instructions were also destroyed. They were given specific instructions on the routes and timing to move uh, the candidates that were selected. During the process, it was found that they didn't need to go to the alternates. The four that they had initially removed from those individual cemeteries met all the criteria. They were American. They died in the service of their country uh, through combat wounds. And there was no identifying marks on either the uniform, the body of the person, or any types of documents. So these all come at separate times to the, the city of Chalon and Champagne. Uh, back then, it was known as Chalon Sun Mar. To ensure, again, that nobody knew which one would be coming in first, they were placed into a single room, all draped with American flags, so that they looked identical. And immediately, the French posted what is called a death watch from French military. And I think that's really important to remember is because France is one of America's oldest allies. They came to our need when we were in the revolution, and when they then called for our men and women to come help them during their time of oppression. You know, a lot of our citizens laid aside, laid aside their personal liberties to, to go to a country they maybe never heard of, definitely maybe never traveled to, to defend others. And it's really important to have them stand that first death watch until the U.S. Army could come and, and form their own death watch, which they picked up sometime after midnight. It was also during this time that the French Officers in charge would routinely kick the death watch out and shift the caskets around uh, before bringing the death watch back in. And this, again, was to ensure that, you know, nobody could say that, well, when I carried a casket in as part of the detail, I put him in the left corner of the room and, and that was the one selected. And I know it came from X cemetery. So, again, trying to keep this selection very, very anonymous uh, certainly helped. Uh, on the morning of October 24th, 1921, Sergeant Younger, Edward Younger, who was on occupation duty in France, was selected to 
make this final selection on behalf of the United States. And I think it's interesting. Sergeant Younger himself is a wounded veteran of World War I. He fought in three out of the four areas where an unknown candidate was selected from. So the chances that he was selecting somebody that was either in his unit or had died next to him or he had fought in battle with was very high. And originally, the selection process was going to follow the British style, which was having an officer go in and make the selection. But the officer, the American Army officer that was tasked with this decided that that was not uh, in the best interest. And he wanted a, an enlisted man to make this selection. So Sergeant Younger had showed up thinking he was just going to be a body bearer that day. And he had no idea that he was going to be given this monumental task of going in and making this selection. And I can't even think of how he prepared mentally to, to do that once he was told, uh, you know, go in and make this happen. He ended up walking, or prior to going into the room, a French gentleman approached him and offered him a spray or a bouquet of white roses. And these roses were picked from, uh, you know, flower beds there in the city. They were white in color, which is very symbolic. They were most likely the variety called the nefetos, which means falling snow. And when he presented these to Sergeant Younger, he said, look, my two boys never returned from the war. Will you please use these flowers as you make the selection over the person who came to liberate us? Sergeant Younger, you know, took those flowers in. He's in the room by himself. He's got patriotic music being played outside and everyone's waiting on him to make the selection from four identical caskets. So he ends up circling the caskets about three different times. And then he later stated that something spoke to him on the third casket from the left. Some Somehow he knew that individual or knew that he had fought with that individual. So he placed the spray of roses on top of the casket. He stepped back and saluted and our unknown soldier was selected. And in 2021, the society went back to France and we paid tribute to this ceremony that happened 100 years ago. We followed in the footsteps of the World War I unknown soldier leaving America. And we visited each of the battlefield cemeteries where a candidate was selected. We paid our respects to the three that were not selected and reburied in the Meuse Argonne uh, American Cemetery. And then were present when the French government in the city of Chalon en Champagne conducted not only a historic vigil to educate their populace again and, and do a reenactment that night prior to the final selection on October 24th. But then that next day, they brought that casket out with reenactors and carried him along the same footsteps that uh, the unknown soldier would have taken to meet the train that would eventually take him to Paris and then from there to the port of Louvre the next day. So the World War I unknown then travels across the Atlantic on the USS Olympia, which was Admiral Dewey's former flagship. And it's quite a trip. Can you tell us about it? Part of my job with learning the history for the centennial was to hopefully dive into more details that, that aren't out there. Tomb guards are really good about knowing their history, but we don't only know a snippet. So I wanted to find out what our other sister services did, is that every time an unknown soldier returned to the United States to be buried on the East Plaza of the Memorial Amphitheater, the U.S. Navy transported them to the mainland, and they were guarded by U.S. Marines. So I asked a, a former Marine who served in Vietnam to do a d little digging on the Olympia and the Marines that were part of this. And what I found out was then, again, in September, the Navy was uh, detailed to send the USS Olympia, which has a very historic history uh, and service to our nation, to France to bring back the unknown soldier. So at the end of September, uh, Captain Graves Erskine, a Marine captain who had been wounded three times in battle during World War I, was tasked with forming up 38 Marines, grabbing them from the sea school down in Norfolk and uh, taking this detachment, aboarding the USS Olympia and then preparing for their duty as the death watches and, and taking over the honor guard once the unknown soldier comes on board. Now, the Olympia went to Britain first to take part in a ceremony where the Medal of Honor was presented to the unknown warrior. Um, and then they met up October 25th uh, there in Luav. And once the ship has arrived, the band, which was made up of the sailors of the ship, um, formed up and huge crowds lined the streets from the train station to the port area, which having been there in 2021 is actually kind of a long trip. 
And accounts of the day stated that, you know, as the unknown soldier was transported through town by horse and carriage with honor guards uh, made up of French and American uh, military, the, the crowds were silent except for mothers crying and and children whispering. And because for the populace, which really has never forgotten what happened in World War One and World War II and, and what America's involvement was, this was huge. You know, they were looking at somebody, again, who traveled to a foreign country to defend their their way of life. And so by coming out and paying their respects, it was a huge day. When the unknown soldier makes it to the port, um, the French government confers upon him the their highest award for valor. And the individual who did it was Andre Maginot, who himself was wounded during World War I. Once that ceremony was complete, the army transfers responsibility of the unknown soldier to the Navy and the Marines, and the casket is brought on board. It's originally placed on the fantail, and flower arrangements and, and things such as that were, were brought on by local children and, and veterans and, and organizations. It's interesting to note that after Sergeant Younger made the selection the day prior, that spray of white roses remains with the casket the entire time until it's his burial in Arlington. Um, and a lot of the historic photographs, you can see that spray on top of the casket as it has moved about. Uh, Captain Erskins and uh, Captain Wyman, the, the, the uh, commanding officer for the Olympia, realized that the casket itself was too big to bring inside the holds or the doorways, uh, ports, and, and to be you know protected by the interior of the ship on the transit across the North Atlantic. Captain Wyman directed that the casket would not be turned on its side and would not be placed in a cargo hold because that was unbefitting this unknown soldier. So during the ceremony, <laughs> Captain Graves uh, came up with an idea that as soon as the ship left port and began its journey, the difficult journey home, the casket would be removed from the fantail and moved to the highest portion of the ship that they could on the outside, which was the signal deck. And in some of the historic photographs, you'll see the signal deck has these two very large uh, towers on it. And they placed the casket there. The ship's carpenters came out and built a wooden uh, transfer case around the casket to protect it from the elements. And then they lashed that to the deck. Now, Marines obviously stood the death watch immediately uh, so that the unknown soldier would never be left alone. And it's it's interesting to note that their dedication to the duty drove them to lashing themselves to the deck when they were on duty so that if the worst happened and for some reason the casket is taken over sea or the ship sinks, that the unknown soldier would never be alone because a Marine would be standing post right next to him. Prior to the ship's departure back in America, um, we were just recovering from two hurricanes that came through the southern portion of the United States up through uh, Florida and the eastern seaboard. And these two hur hurricanes did some significant damage during the time frame and had uh, moved out to sea to dissipate. And of course, as you know, it, it probably should be, uh, the Olympia's course met up with these uh, the remnants of these two hurricanes. And for the longest time, the captain, uh, Captain Wyman, wasn't really sure that he was going to be able to not only complete his mission, which was simply, you will arrive on November 9th with the unknown soldier and keep a ship afloat. Because the, as Captain Graves mentioned later in one of his um, letters, the, the ship was too short for the long waves and too long for the short waves and was just taking an absolute beating. They almost lost a Marine. Um, he gets caught up in a wave and, and gets starts to get washed overboard. But because he had tied himself to the deck, he remained on board. His boots, however, went overboard when they filled up with water. The crew and, and uh, that weren't on duty, uh, both the Marines and the sailors, met up in the galley, which is about the center portion of the ship. And if you've never been to the USS Olympia, which is in Philadelphia at the Independent Seaport Museum, I strongly suggest you go there because like myself, an army, a guy, a landlubber, um, you'll realize quickly that the ship is not exactly watertight and wasn't designed to be so watertight. There were holes actually in gun rail or uh, um, troughs built into the decks to to channel water as it comes in outside. Captain Wyman uh, asks a chaplain that had had caught a ride, an army chaplain that had caught a ride um, back to the United States to to say a prayer, you know, asking for better weather, <laughs> asking for completion of this very important mission. 
And sure enough, within a day that, the, you know, they'd broken out of the, the remnants of those two hurricanes and uh, got into normal weather, I guess, for the October, November time frame of the uh, North Atlantic. And they make it to the historic Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. on November 9th. How is the unknown soldier received after that? Well, once the Olympia arrives at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C., they're met by ceremonial units um, from the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. The U.S. Marine Corps band was present, as well as dignitaries um, and Medal of Honor recipients that had been chosen by General Pershing, excuse me, General of the Army's Pershing, to act as body bearers. So you can imagine, I guess the best way to describe it is a full honors military ceremony as the unknown soldiers carried down the um, gangway and and first touches back on his soil, uh, the soil of his birth, the national anthem is played, and he's placed onto the back of a caisson, uh, much like you see that is in use in Arlington National Cemetery today. That caisson is then escorted uh, through the streets of Washington, D.C., up to the U.S. Capitol, where the unknown soldier would lay in state for two days, or at least until the morning of November 11th. This presents an opportunity not only for the dignitaries and our government's leaders to, to pay their respects to the unknown soldier as he lays in the rotunda of the Capitol, but for the public and thousands upon thousands of American Gold Star mothers, veterans, and just citizens in general lined up outside the Capitol day and night to have the opportunity to pay their respects. And this is prominent, I think, because a lot of people nowadays don't realize how hard it was for those American Gold Star families and and the impact that uh, seeing their loved one get on a train and never return or ship and never return was on them. So for many of these families, they felt that this unknown soldier was their loved one. They firmly believed it, that theirs was the one that was selected, that he would represent all those who, of, all of those who had fallen and sacrificed in this war. So it's very personal to them. And it's very personal to the veterans um, of the war, because that could be their buddy, their battle buddy that stood next to them that didn't return during a battle. And then just the citizenry, as well as foreign governments wanting to pay their respects. So it was a very moving couple of days and nights uh, to the point where they had to they had to turn away thousands of people because they just didn't have the time to let them all come through and pay their respects. This idea of having two days to to do this, um, we asked to be recreated in 2021 on November 9th and 10th of last year. But instead of going to the Capitol building, allowing the public to come onto the plaza of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and pay their respects by laying a flower, and um, it, that was a powerful and beautiful moment for a lot of the citizens who were never going to be allowed inside the chains or, or be that close to not only the Crips, but the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier itself. And I've spoken with some of the Sentinels that were on duty that day, and, and they were impacted by listening to the crowd. And again, you could hear the same thing that was heard in, in uh, the city streets of Luav. You could hear families sniffling and crying um, as they paid their respects, you know, 100 years later at the tomb itself. And that for the most part, pretty much concludes getting this the unknown soldier to the Capitol building prior to his actual burial in Arlington. On November 11th, 1921, the unknown is laid to rest in the tomb. Can you tell us about the ceremony, who participates, and what honors are received by the unknown? Um, the unknown soldier is taken from the Capitol building that morning and, again, placed onto a caisson and with full military honors and units from all of the branches of the military, including veterans, including civic organizations, like such as the Daughters of the American Revolution, American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, those, those types of organizations, they proceed um, through the city streets of Washington, D.C. to Arlington. And back in the day, the Memorial Bridge was not created, so they had to make this long route up through the Georgetown Bridge and then down into Arlington National Cemetery itself. So you can imagine that took a long time. A thing that people also don't remember is that, um, you know, there's no live TV, there's no satellite, uh, there's there's no internet, there's no phones. No one had even thought of anything called a podcast back then. So, you know, most of the time people got their news by either being present if they were lucky or reading about it a few days later in the newspaper. So uh, the precursor to AT&T wanted to do a live phone call 
of the ceremony. So, and unfortunately, they didn't record it, but they did this live phone call, which we would call a broadcast. And from the time the animal soldier left the Capitol building to the time the burial is complete, they're playing this so that people can hear it. And they have uh, microphones set up inside the amphitheater. They have speakers set up to where those 100,000 people that, that went to Arlington could hear it by standing outside of the amphitheater if they weren't lucky enough to be inside. At the same time, that phone call was was relayed to San Francisco and up to New York City. So the populace could come to those key locations where that broadcast was being put and listen in. And this, this truly made it a, a, a national event. It wasn't just a singular, you know, if you just happen to be in town kind of a thing. The, the whole nation was able to participate in it. So once the Unknown Soldier is in the Memorial Amphitheater, President Harding uh, gives an address, and it's very passionate, and I, I encourage everyone to read it. Um, he talks about the sacrifice. He talks about the Gold Star Mothers and not knowing who that person was. You know, at the end of the day, that Unknown Soldier didn't represent a class of Americans or a religious organization or a political party. Um, you know, it truly was an American and, and embodies us all and all of our cultures and, and and the way that we live our lives. He presents the Unknown Soldier with the Congressional Medal of Honor, as well as the Distinguished Service Cross. And then other nations that were present, uh, mainly allied nations, present their highest award for valor to our unknown soldier. And all of those are on display in the Memorial Amphitheater. And, and again, I suggest and recommend everyone gets a chance to go there and, and view those artifacts. From here, the unknown soldier is carried out the south end of the amphitheater and to the, the plaza itself where small tomb uh, of white car, uh, Colorado marble. Once there, uh, religious rites were, were said, and prior to individuals and others laying wreaths at the tomb, a gentleman by the name of Chief Plenty Coup, who had been named the chief of chiefs of all uh, Native American nations, um, stepped forward, and he said a prayer in his native tongue. He's, he's a Crow uh, Indian, and he said a prayer to the unknown soldier, and he talked about the bonds between brothers between warriors of white and red and, and how going forward this is important. He then conferred upon this unknown soldier his war bonnet and Chief Plenty Coup's battle honors and the things that he had done in his life created this war bonnet, which was immense. And it represented everything. And to have someone present their war bonnet to another is a high honor. He also presents the coup stick that he carried and these are also on display in Arlington National Cemetery. And it really tied in together that, that this is an American. It doesn't matter where he came from. It only matters that he he gave up his, not only his life, but his identity for others to be able to live. Taps was played, and then the unknown soldier was lowered into his final resting place. And again, the flowers that Sergeant Younger had used to select the unknown soldier, the flowers that stayed with him during the difficult journey home aboard the USS Olympia reside with him in the tomb today. I've always thought it was just an incredible ceremony. It would have been amazing. I think if, you know, we could have a time machine to go back and be there because it's so unique. I think. There is some amazing video or uh, movie reels, I guess would be the best way to describe it. That was done at the time. So you can see it. You unfortunately can't hear what was being said. Um, the National Archives has a copy of those. I know that they're attached to our website as well, so you can you can review them. But it's it's really interesting to watch from a ceremonial standpoint um, how they did things, you know, back in 1921. And you're right; it would have been overwhelming, I think, to to be present on that day. I know that it was overwhelming to go back and participate with the French in both Chalon uh, and Champagne and the Havre as they honored the unknown soldier a hundred years later. So yeah, I, I think it would have been nice to hear that. I just wish they had the technology that would have recorded it. So what does the 1921 tomb look like and how does it evolve after that? Good question. So the 1921 tomb is actually small. If you're able to look at photographs of the tomb today, you'll see the base as it comes up and forms that first little uh, indentation. That, that was it. It wasn't very tall. It was flat. It had an inscription on it. There was a sign posted outside of it identifying what it was. And Congress had originally approved the creation of the tomb, and they wanted it something simple. 
Unfortunately, what happened during the time period from 1921 to about 1925, there was no guards at the tomb. And if you've ever been to Arlington National Cemetery, you understand it's on a hill. It overlooks Washington, D.C. And, you know, before the trees had really built up, it, it must have been an impressive sight to take in all of our nation's capital from that height. And of course, there's a nice little flat platform that I can stand on to get a better picture or just a view, or it looked like a great place to have a picnic. I don't know why people would do that, but veterans had seen those things happen. They petitioned the War Department to stop that immediately, to post guards. And so guards were posted in November of 1925 as the government went about the process of creating what the tomb looks like today. The tomb itself is uh, about 79 tons, and I want to say it's seven or nine pieces of, of marble. As this marble came from Colorado, it's actually Yule marble, the architect, Lorimar Rich, um, had, had won the design competition to make the tomb what you see today. And uh, Thomas Hudson Jones was the sculptor. And you can imagine the pressure of having to create this tomb, you know, the architect designed and now going at it, knowing that you're, you're doing it in marble and you get one shot. There, there is no, there's no makeup on this unless you bring in another giant block of, of marble. So as people look at the tomb today, if they look on the north and south faces of the tomb, they're going to see three inverted wreaths on each side. And tomb guards know the exact makeup of these wreaths down to how many leaves and berries are on the tomb itself, um, how many of them and where they are that it may have been chipped over time. On the east side, which unfortunately the public doesn't get a chance to see much because it's at the top of the long set of stairs, you have three figures. And in the middle is victory, and they're all joined together. Victory is is in between peace and valor, because without the all three of those, we can't have what is there today. And it talks about the larger uh, and broader aspect of of service and sacrifice, and and what it takes. If you ever see any photos of that, take a look at it. It's a beautiful uh, work of art on on this uh, headstone. On the west side, of course, is going to be the the uh, iconic saying that everybody sees, and I think that's what most of the public think is is the front of the tomb of the Indian soldiers. It's technically the back, um, and it, and the, the iconic words are, of course, "Here rests in honor, glory, an American soldier known but to God." You know, there are a number of flaws on the tomb itself, starting probably with the most notable, which is the large crack that goes all the way around it. Um, other small things um, you really have to pay attention to. And, and one of the things I think the public could see right off the bat if they look at photos is when they read those iconic words and they get to the word honored, they'll see how the R and the E are actually connected instead of separate like all the other letters on the portion of that face of the tomb. That's was finished in uh, April of 1932. When does the tomb receive a guard? And when is the 3rd Infantry Regiment officially assigned to the tomb? Good question. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting because a lot of people think that the regiment that stands today was the one that has been there forever. And, and that's not the case. On uh, 17 November 1925, a civilian guard was posted. Uh, that civilian guard came out of the uh, Quartermaster Corps, and they were posted to protect the tomb with simple instructions as to prevent desecration and disrespect to the tomb. They were only present in Arlington National Cemetery during the hours that the cemetery was open, so it was not a 24-hour guard. As the tomb itself was being built uh, into what you see today, the military took over that guard post on March 25th, 1926. And quite honest, quite honestly, almost immediately, the guard said, this needs to go to 24 hours a day. We cannot simply guard it in the daytime and then let it remain unguarded at night. This was denied by the War Department, at least until 1932. Um, and the first units that made up this rotating guard came from units that were assigned to the Military District of Washington, or what was known back then as the Washington Provisional Brigade. So you've got uh, units stationed at Fort Myer, um, Fort Meade, Fort Belvoir, Fort Washington, and Fort Humphreys. And on, a, I think it was a 30-day is a 30-day or two-week rotating basis. I think it started at two week and then it went to 30 days at some point. Units would send soldiers down to be tomb guards. 
the SOPs that we have were written um, about the time frame that uh, Colonel Patton was assigned to the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, and they were the first ones to stand the military watch, just as they were the first ones to receive the unknown soldier when he returned home on November 9th, 1921. 3rd Cavalry, or in, in, in fact, the 2nd Squadron was stationed at Fort Myer, and they guarded the unknown soldier from 26 to 1942. Along with them, you had the 3rd Battalion, 12th Infantry Regiment coming out of Fort Washington, Maryland, that served and provided guards. Um, the 16th Infantry Brigade out of Fort Humphreys and Fort Meade provided guards. The 13th Engineer Battalion out of Fort Belvoir provided guards. And the 703rd Military Police Battalion out of the Arlington Catonement. Again, it, do some research on Arlington National Cemetery. You'll realize that the southern portion of it was actually a, a military base at one point. They all provided guards. And this kind of stayed that way up until about 1942. You know, now we're into World War II and these units are being rotated overseas. So a ceremonial detachment was created of the Washington Provisional Brigade um, was formed to take on the duties. Um, then it became a single unit that uh, was standing the watch. And these soldiers stood the watch up and through April 6th of 1948 when the first, when the, well, the third United States Infantry Regiment, which is known as the Old Guard, uh, was reactivated and given the duty. And they have held that duty since April 6, 1948. You know, the Old Guard is the oldest infantry unit in the Army. Uh, it was given its nickname, the Old Guard of the Army, after a bayonet charge that it led during uh, battles in Mexico in 1847. From there, that's that's it's never been anything other but than U.S. Army soldiers that have stood the watch. There's a lot of misconception that Marines stand the watch, but it's the Army. Um, that was given the highest honor to do this active duty guard post because of the senior service. So we've talked about the United States and some of the other allies, but what about the central powers? Do any of those nations have a monument for their World War I unknowns? Uh, yes and no. <clears throat> At the end of World War II, or I'm sorry, World War I, the main central powers were all predominantly the exception of Bulgaria empires. And those empires ceased to exist. So then they fell back into nation states. So, you know, you have the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But from what I've been able to research, you know, countries like Germany and Austria, uh, Hungary, I'm sorry, Turkey, and some of the subsets that um, fought as central powers don't have a tomb of the unknown soldier. They don't have a single body that represents all of their fallen from World War I. They have monuments. And those can range from everything to all that have fallen in the creation of their country or service to their country, but but not to World War I. Poland and Finland do have an unknown soldier. And there's one other one off the top of my head. I can't, I think it was Lithuania does. And their unknown soldiers, actually two, they took them from two different theaters and, and created a, an area for their tomb to, to recognize all that fell during those conflicts. There are plenty of countries that that served or sent people in World War I at different points that do have tombs, much like you mentioned with you know France, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Iraq has one. But that's the only ones that I, I can think of off the top of my head. Final thoughts on the tomb and the World War I unknown? I think there's a lot of misconception about the tomb and the unknown soldier for the public. I think that the misnaming of it in around the 1958 by the media and, and it continues through today where they say it's the tomb of the unknowns does an incredible disservice to each of the bodies that is buried. The grave, the tall grave, is the burial location of an unknown American who fell in World War I. He represents all that fell in the war, but it is his grave. It's just like all the other graves in Arlington National Cemetery. It gets this name of, or misnaming, I should say, of Tomb of the Unknowns, because people think there's more than one body buried in the tomb, and there's not. There's only one. In 1958, the World War II Unknown Soldier and the Korean War Unknown Soldier were buried in their own individual graves, which we call crypts, just a few feet to the west of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. They represent the fallen and the service and sacrifice from those conflicts. So when you misname them and you lump them all together into one title of Tomb of the Unknowns, you really do a disservice, not only to those individual soldiers that are buried there and what they represent, but to the families, the American Gold Star families and the mothers that lost their children, lost their fathers, lost their sons, lost their daughters in conflict. 
So let's not separate it. The official title is Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and there are three bodies that are buried on the plaza of the Memorial Amphitheater, specifically the East Plaza. Now, in between World War II and Korea, there's an empty crypt. That empty crypt used to have the remains of the Vietnam Unknown Soldier. And again, that individual was selected or designated, in this case, to represent all the fallen missing from Vietnam. And as we know, in 1998, the body was disinterred and identified as Captain Michael Blase and buried under his own name at St. Louis. So as as people go to battlefields, both here in the United States and overseas, a lot of times you're going to come across a monument. The monument could be to a unit, uh, an action of the battle itself. And those monuments are very powerful and important to those that have ties to that specific conflict. So if I go to Gettysburg and I'm with I'm at Little Round Top, where Chamberlain did his historic battle bayonet charge down the hill, receiving the Medal of Honor, you know, with the main unit. As the people that have direct ties to that unit pass on, the history fades. And it just becomes a picture that someone shows up when they go to Gettysburg, take a picture. Oh, this is cool. I learned about the history. The two in the Unknown Soldiers, not that way. It's not a monument. It's a grave. It's an individual who represents all. So it is a place where we can come as a nation and pay our respects to service and sacrifice to those unidentified Americans who gave their lives and their identity so that others may be free. It's it's a place, you know, again, go back to World War I, go back to the conflicts prior to that. The American public didn't have, you know, the opportunity to jump on an airplane, shoot on over to France to visit their loved one who's buried overseas. They had to have a location to, to pay their respects if their loved ones are buried overseas in an unknown grave. And the tomb is that focal point for our nation to remember service and sacrifice. It's also a focal point, as I found out talking to former MDW commanders, that when foreign dignitaries show up, they see America's commitment to her veterans by having an active duty soldier posted at a grave 24-7, saying no one will disrespect this unknown soldier. This unknown soldier, these unknown soldiers will have eternal rest under our eternal vigilance. And many times, and and this has been passed to me by, again, an MDW commander, that foreign dignitary turns and says, if this is what you do for your dead, I can only imagine what you do for your military and your people. And I want to be an ally with you. And again, it's that commitment that the public gets to see daily, 24 hours a day. You know, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you go to the kitchen sink to get a drink of water, whatever, you look out your window, you know, at that moment, a young you know, man and woman is standing the watch at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, no matter what the weather is. So that's why I think it's it's truly important that we educate our public about not only what the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is and the history behind it, which is very unique and interesting, but the bigger, the higher meaning of why it's there in the first place. It was never designed to just honor World War I. It was designed by Hamilton and, and pushed by Pershing to be a focal point for our nation to remember, honor, and respect. Well, it's a very, very powerful place to visit, too. Very, very moving. So you served as a tomb guard, and you are the co-founder of the Society of the Honor Guard, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So tell us a little bit about your experience guarding the tomb and then the mission of the society. My experience, I was lucky enough to be selected to serve at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier from 1997 through 1998. I came into the 3rd Infantry Regiment having two, well, three other unit assignments. I was just coming out of my second assignment in Italy when I was selected to go to the old guard. So during my previous deployments and and assignments, I'd lost brothers in combat. I'd lost them in peacetime or they just, you know, had passed on. So I already understood the meaning of service and sacrifice on a couple different levels. Getting the opportunity to serve as the first relief commander and then later as the assistant sergeant of the guard was an honor. It gave me an opportunity to continually pay my respects to all that had come before me and all that had sacrificed so that I could be where I am um, and that my family could live the life that it leaves. I hope to uh, to have passed that emotion and experience onto the Sentinels that were underneath me during my relief, because most of them had never been deployed or, or been to another assignment. So this was what they saw of the Army. They didn't see some of the bigger pictures of the Army. The training process was very, very regimented, very strict, very hard. I'd come into it thinking that I could call commands well and march well. Um, I'd been in the Army 
seven years at that point. So I, you know, I thought I could do it. I learned very quickly that I couldn't, uh, not to the standard that was expected at the platoon. In fact, you know, I had to relearn how to walk. And they did that by taking you to the corner of the road where the curb is and learning how to walk on the curb without bouncing, falling off or looking. So trying to understand and learn my duties at the active duty guard post, the ceremonies that will be conducted, the actual guard change itself, as well as making sure my uniform was squared away to the standards that's expected, making sure that I understood the knowledge and the history behind not only the tomb itself, but Arlington National Cemetery, the military, uh, as well as about 200 different graves inside the cemetery, was a pretty daunting task. And um, a lot of the training techniques that were placed upon me to, to learn those skills, I actually have carried over into my personal life and, and into my current business. I can bet you I can do a three-minute dress drill today if needed to go from one set of clothes to another. I still iron pretty much everything I own. I tuck my shoelace. Um, I don't do some of the crazy things like some of the older guards, like ironing their underwear and socks, but, uh, you know, maybe my standards are slipping just a bit, but I've carried a lot of that into my personal life, especially when it comes to the training process. Uh, when I trained other people on different skills, I use the same styles and techniques. It really imparted a lot on me as a mid-grade non-commissioned officer. And it was uh, it was something that that I felt was important. So when we created the society in 1999, um, we didn't want to be just another veterans organization. We didn't want to just have reunions and you know get-togethers you know every year. We wanted to have a mission, and and every one of us agreed that our mission was to continue to honor the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, to continue to educate people about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. There's so many crazy stories out there about what we do and what the tomb is. So I'm very proud to work with a great group of brothers and sister tomb guards as we go about telling the story for free in, in communities or organizations that request it. It's super easy to do so. I've learned that in all of my combat experience or unit experiences, I've got great friends. And I can probably pull a handful of them, you know, from memory and say, yeah, the, these guys I'm going to stay connected with. Not so with the tomb. I have more friends that are tomb guards that served before I was there that were, well, they, they served before I was even born that I consider my friends and mentors. And now the younger generation today are carrying on the same traditions that were started in 1932 when the first military took over and had that 24 hour vigil, which has remained constant. It's an interesting group of men and women. Um, they all, come into it from different walks of life, different experiences, but they learn very quickly as they go through the training process that it's not about us. We're not the story. The tomb is the story. Those unknown soldiers are the story and what they mean to America. And we just are very blessed to be given the opportunity to ensure their eternal rest. Well, thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.